Things are much worse out here than I thought. I barricaded myself into the guard's office using the desk and the break room table. I'm covered in things I can't even think about, and I don't know what to do. If I die out here, it's my own damn fault. Damn it. Why did I come back? I, I have to stick to the story. People have to know what happened. I went to the storage room like I said I would. It had all these boxes. I was really careful to be as quiet as possible, to make sure no one saw me go in, not into the research building, and definitely not into the storage room, but someone must have seen me, that or a silent alarm. Maybe that's it. I started going through the boxes and at first, it was what it was supposed to be, cleaned up skeletons separated and broken down to be shipped out, but I had to keep looking, didn't I? In the back of the room, I found a few boxes sealed up with orange tape and labeled to be put in the incinerator. I cut them all open and put the knife back in my pocket before I started looking inside of them. The first one had random clothing inside. It took me a second, but I realized it was the clothing the bodies had shown up in. They stripped most of them before they laid them out. The box was a little creepy, but nothing suspicious. Not until I opened the second box. The first shirt I pulled out was a kind I knew too well. I knew it because I was wearing one just like it. It was a guard's uniform shirt, and it didn't stop at one. The whole box was filled with uniform shirts and pants, black socks and shoes and belts. Two, I counted four, five, six uniforms, and as I pulled each one out, my heart pounded louder. So loud I didn't hear someone enter the room behind me. They must have snuck up on me and hit me over the head, because in an instant, Everything went black. I woke up with my back on cold rocks and the ocean screaming in my ears. The way my legs and arms felt I must have been injected with something. It was more druggy and numb than a concussion, and as my eyes tried to focus, I started to make out the shapes of toothy rocks overhead. My wrists were tied behind me and I could barely feel them pinned under my back. The ceiling was all rock and barely 10 feet above. There was almost no light, but the little bit of it seemed to come from the same direction as the sound of ocean waves. I turned to my head and it felt like dragging a bag of rocks. I found myself looking into the terrified eyes of Eric. Eric, the guard who I was told called out sick, was lying next to me in the dark. His face was stained from crying and he was mumbling to himself, but I couldn't make out what it was. It sounded like, Thathukim, Thathukim. My head was swimming so badly I tried to ask him what was happening, but I could barely form the words. Finally, I managed to get them out and he only repeated his mumbling louder and louder until he was screaming and crying the words at me. They took him. They took them. I was still disoriented. I, I didn't understand what he was talking about, but I did my best to keep my eyes in focus and look down where he was looking now, still screaming and that's when I saw what he was talking about. His feet. His feet were gone cut off cleanly above the ankle with the stubs wrapped in bandages. It wasn't messy at all, but clean, professional, and even as I looked down at the horrors flopping at the ends of Eric's legs, I knew my suspicions were true. No regular man had done this. A doctor had. A surgeon. Someone too familiar with how the human body was put together, and more importantly, how it was taken apart. The shock of the sight cleared my head. I tried my best to calm Eric down using only my voice since the rest of me was bound, but it wasn't easy. He seemed to be hurting pretty bad. Eventually I got him to stop yelling long enough to ask him who did this and why. He was in a daze, retreating inside his own mind or about to pass out from the pain, but finally he said something. Trying. Trying to bring him back. Who? Who is he trying to bring back? I asked him, but he was completely catatonic. He wasn't going to be any more help, and I knew I had to focus on getting out of there or I would end up like him or worse. First I would save myself and then I'd come back for him, but then I heard a voice, a woman's voice. That made my heart jump in pure relief. Are you okay? Terry asked. She shone a flashlight on us and I could see by its light she was upset. I was so happy to see her I must have cursed ten different ways while laughing. I told her to untie me before that fucking psycho doctor came back to finish the job but she went around to Eric first. She had a scalpel in her other hand, perfect for cutting rope, and I was glad to see she was prepared. I told her if she untied me first, I could help her with Eric, but she looked up at me, and with this blank expression I can't explain, she just said, 
I'm sorry. Before I could make a sound, she stuck the blade in Eric's throat. Blood bubbled up and Eric gurgled wide-eyed. While all I could do was watch him struggle, it was too much. I turned my head and waited for the awful sounds to stop, and by the time I looked back, Eric was gone. My stomach clenched as I realized the one person I thought I could trust had just murdered a man in front of me. Thank you, Terry said to Eric's corpse. Her voice sounded so genuine, like she was talking to a friend. I screamed at her and asked her what she was thanking him for. For donating his body, she answered, as if it was obvious. Without donors like Eric, William can't come back. Who the fuck is William? But as I said it, I already knew the answer. I told you my brother went to a facility like this one, but that wasn't the whole truth. It wasn't just like this one. It was this one. William is here. He's here and he needs me. Even in the dim light, I saw the look in her eyes, like every emotion was fighting inside of her. I can hear him calling out for help. I don't want to do these things, but he needs my help. Don't you see? Not just any parts will do. The doctor needs the bodies for his research, but they stopped funding him. Neither of us could let that happen, so I helped him. I put all those ads out. I called the agency. I got him what we both needed. Her eyes were full of tears. I couldn't believe how completely she fooled me into thinking she was a nice, sweet girl, and now it was obvious she had lost her mind. But believe it or not, she was still my best chance at getting out alive. The doctor doesn't care about you or your brother, he's using you, I said. You think I don't know that? He has his reasons and I have mine. We both make sacrifices to save lives. That's correct, dear, a man said behind her. Dr. Christensen stepped into the light wearing a rubber apron, like a busher at a meat processing plant. Sacrifices are always needed in the name of science. His mood was nonchalant, as if it was another day at the office. I told him he'd never get away with this that someone would come looking into the disappearances, that they'd wonder what he was still doing out here after they cut his funding. You're more right than you know. By next week, this facility will sadly be shut down. He was saying it as much to Terry as he was to me. Terry didn't take well to the news at all. She got in his face, freaked out on him, shouted how William wouldn't be finished by next week, which honestly I didn't know what it meant, and I didn't want to know. But. He calmly told her the situation was unavoidable. He reminded her there was still time to finish what they started. When he said it, he looked over at me. Terry turned her attention back to me and she... I don't even want to say this, but she smiled at me. Smiled like she was still flirting with me. Meanwhile, I was lying in Eric's spreading blood. You really do have kind eyes, she said. Just like William. She came back and bent over me with the scalpel squeezed between her fingers. What she didn't know was I had a blade of my own, the knife which I'd managed to get out of my back pocket and was using to work on the ropes around my wrists. I cut myself a few times with it, but nothing serious. I tried not to show it on my face as she came closer. She smiled sadly as she brought the scalpel to my face. He'll be happy to have his eyes back. But suddenly the doctor was over her. And before either of us could react, he stuck a hypodermic needle full of something pinkish into her neck and squeezed. She fell off of me and immediately began to shake and spasm on the floor. The pain sounds that came out of her mouth were sickening. The doctor said, Relax dear, thousands of people are embalmed every day. I realized what he meant. The needle, it was filled with embalming fluid and God knows what else. I can't imagine what it must do to a living person, but based on Terry's reaction, the foam in her mouth, the sound of her swallowing her tongue, it didn't look good. The bastard was cleaning up his mess, and I refused to be a part of it. Refused to be another body for his farm. That's why, as he was distracted watching Terry writhe on the floor with his back to me, I finished cutting the rope around my wrist and did the same for the one around my ankles. With everything in me, I jumped on the unsuspecting prick and drove the small knife into his back. He cried out and collapsed under me, and we both fell to the rocky floor. I pulled the knife out of him and prepared to stab him again. But a bright flash blinded me and a loud boom echoed so loudly in the thin space that it went deaf and I felt my knees buckle and the knife fall out of my hand. It was a gunshot, a wild shot in the dark from a gun I hadn't seen in his hand. He had been about to finish off Terry when I jumped on him. Completely disoriented, I stumbled away from the doctor and into the dark. 
Soon I was stepping into the freezing cold water, ocean water, and I fell into it and pulled myself through the dark towards the faint moonlight, and I didn't stop pulling until I emerged from the rocks and into the night. How long had I been out? There was no time to think about it. I pulled myself up to the rocky, wavy shore and up into the island where I found myself standing about the mouth of the cave. It seemed Eric hadn't been lying about it after all. Not about to wait for the doctor to follow me out, and knowing that there was another way out of that cave considering both Terry and the doctor's clothes had been dry, I did the smartest thing I have done all day. I ran. I wish I could say I jumped into the water and swam and swam until I reached the shore, but the ocean was too choppy and I've heard too many stories growing up around here of people drowning in the ocean at night. The undertows have claimed too many people for me to make a move like that. I followed the shoreline at first and made sure I didn't get lost in the trees, but soon I heard the doctor's voice calling out and his footsteps pounding the ground somewhere far behind me. Something bad was still in my blood, making my head groggy and my legs feel soft and distant and where normally I could easily outrun him, I could hear him start to gain on me. With no choices left, I turned and ran into the woods. My coordination was all wrong, and more than once I tripped on roots and slammed into trees, but I kept running. Even as his voice got closer and his footsteps got louder, I kept running. Soon my nose filled up with a dead smell, and I came across a caged body between two trees. The man had been obese in life, and in death, it was a crawling mound of putrid fat lying on its side. At that moment, the doctor called out to me again, and his voice was so close now, and I knew he had that gun, and those needles, and who knows what else, and so I did the only thing I could think of, which was also the worst thing I could think of. I lifted the cage and crawled in. I was immediately hit with the powerful smell of the rotting man. There was no time to think. I let the cage back down and wedged myself in next to the cold corpse. I grabbed him by the arm and pulled him over me like an oozing blanket, as much as I could shove my nose and mouth tight, but there was only so much I could do. Its fluids leaked down onto me and maggots tumbled into my hair, onto my clothes, down the collar of my shirt. Footsteps. The doctor was walking past me, past us. I held my breath for what felt like years as he continued on past and into the woods, even as something with a thousand tiny legs crawled over my neck and behind my ear. When I was sure the doctor was gone, I carefully, slowly, pushed the huge corpse off of me and got out of the cage. I shook the maggots off, took three steps, and threw up until there was nothing left to throw up. I ran in a different direction than I heard the doctor go, and by some miracle, I found my way to the docks where I had prayed to find a boat of some kind, something either of them had used to get to the island, but my prayings weren't answered. There was no time to cry about it, though, because... I had one goal and one goal only, to get to that radio and call for help, call for police, call the army, call anyone to come out here and get me. I wasn't screwing around anymore. I barricaded myself into the office by locking the door, then flipping over the desk and shoving it against the door. Then I took the table from the break area, flipped it long side up, and pushed it against the window. When I went into the room where the radio was kept, something like hope died in me. The radio was destroyed. I came back out, went to the computer, I started writing this because I don't know how else to tell people what happened out here. When the doctor gets here, I'll give him hell, and I intend to beat the med school brains out of him, but in case he gets the better of me, I need the world to know what went down on this island, I just... Pff, my god, the most terrifying thing. I just looked up to see the doctor staring at me through the door's window. I ran into the other room to find something to hit him with in case he gets in, but then there was this horrible sound. I can't even describe it wet shrieking, and then these red lights started coming through the windows and the doctor started screaming, brutal, terrified screams like something was attacking him, and he fired his gun two, three times, then it sounded like whatever it was got to him because he screamed and then his voice cut out. It's, it's being on the door now, the red light, it won't stop. What is it? What, what is it? Listen, I'm writing this because I have no phone and no one to email, my my father is dead, and my mother might as well be. I have no friends and no one to help me. Don't come out of here. I'll update tomorrow. I'll be okay. I'll think of something. God, I just don't want to come out here. Before I sign off, I have something to confess. I was...
Yo. Action pack, black Mac 10, Junior and his friend. Not a pot to piss and starving brothers on a mission. Half past two, bring your plan around the tow booth. GW Bridge, got the weapon concealed, nothing to lose. They choose to break the rules at all costs. Stick them in Jersey, hit the other side of New York. Black and red leather suits and black biker boots. One got the gun, the other one controls the motorbike. Adrenaline pumping, dreams of cash. Anybody try to stop them getting lead in their face, believe that. Black pack.